YouTube. <clears throat> this video was being done to correct uh, an incorrect video I had done uh, about 18 months ago <coughs> on the Abercrombie & Fitch Ideal Cruiser tent. I had misidentified the tent as an Ideal Cruiser when in reality it is an Explorer. Now as soon as I publish this video I'm going to delete that other video. I hope I don't get in trouble with YouTube because I am going to be using some of the footage from that original video. Uh, and what that will do for you who are new to the channel, if you've been to the ch with the channel since the beginning of the history of camping gear, or if you have gone back and watched some of the older videos, you'll see uh, this is an example of how I have been able to improve the uh, production values of the channel, uh, it's a bit embarrassing to me, uh, not because it's being, if in the older video, it's being filmed in my uh, uh, dining room, uh, but because I was using a video technique called jump shots, uh, which uh, it's recommended that you change the focus or the view every five to ten seconds in order to maintain interest in the video. Uh, I did it badly, uh, and I don't do it anymore, in case you, in case this is the first video you've seen, I, I don't do that anymore. Uh, but this is on the Abercrombie & Fitch Ideal Cruiser and Explorer Tents. I'm calling the video Abercrombie & Fitch Cruiser Tents, because these are essentially tents of the same basic design. Uh, the changes are primarily in size, okay? So what follows right now after I stop blathering here will be the uh, footage from the original video uh, that explains the company of Abercrombie & Fitch, where they came from uh, and, and who was in it, a bit of the history of the company, before the Second World War. Some of you know that Abercrombie and Fitch has, well, changed somewhat. It no longer sells uh, quality camping gear. But anyway, rather than let this old man blather on, let's listen to this old man. Okay, so let's talk about the company first, just so that I can confuse you right away, real good. In 1892, a fellow named David Abercrombie started a storefront in uh, Manhattan selling uh, camping gear to rich folks. He had decided that that was going to be his clientele. He wanted to sell to the elite the people with the most money, and he wanted to sell high-quality gear that uh, would be affordable pretty much only by the elite. He had a customer uh, named uh, Ezra Fitch. Now, Ezra was a high-powered lawyer, but he loved to go hunting and camping and fishing. And he got tired of being a lawyer. He just wanted to hunt and camp and fish all the time. So uh, in 1900, he convinced David Abercrombie to let him invest in his company. By 1904, Fitch had invested enough that he became a full partner. And they changed the name from David Abercrombie Company to Abercrombie and Fitch. Uh, and that's when the trouble started. You see, David Abercrombie was, uh, he was the design brains behind the, uh, behind the outfit. He wanted to design and use 
good camping gear, expedition level stuff. But Fitch, he wanted to make a lot of money and he thought that by doing, by, by adding other products other than camping and hunting gear, like things like clothing, uh, to, the, uh, to the lineup, to the catalog, and expand the customer base. Uh, he and David had tremendous fights, it is reported, uh, about the direction the company was taking. And by 1907, uh, David Abercrombie had pretty much had enough. And he quit. He, he bought, he, he sold his shares to Ezra Fitch, and he went back and restarted his company, the David Abercrombie Company. But pretty much, almost immediately, he changed the name. He changed it to Abercrombie's Camp. Okay? Now... He was a competitor, but he wasn't stupid, and neither was Ezra Fitch. David Abercrombie's products were sold in the Abercrombie and Fitch stores and catalogs. You with me so far? Okay, now it gets a little bit more complicated where it comes to this tent. Okay, this tent was sold by Von Langerke and Antoine out of Chicago. Von Langerke and Antoine started out in New York as Von Langerke and Detmold. Okay? And then Von Langerke expanded to Chicago, got together with a guy named Antoine, and then he had Von Langerke and Antoine. Now, they sold David Abercrombie's products, Abercrombie Camp products. Okay, you with me so far? He was their sole, sole provider for camping goods. Uh, the Chicago store became very famous because they were the primary arms dealer for Al Capone's mafia mob in Chicago. Okay? Okay, now, in 1928... David Ang Abercrombie uh, had a personal tragedy in his family. He kind of backed off from the business a little bit. And Abercrombie and Fitch went and bought Von Langerke and Antoine and Von Langerke and Detmold. And they became the sole supplier of camping gear for the Von Langerke stores. But they also sold Abercrombie's camp products to the same store that had been selling them before. You with me so far? In 1931, David Abercrombie died. The, the uh, company he founded, Abercrombie's Camp, didn't go much further than that. His son really didn't have any, any uh, fire in the belly for the business. And, and the David Abercrombie Company, Abercrombie's Camp, uh, faded from existence. Abercrombie and Fitch stuck around, and for the next couple of decades, they were the primary supplier to the elite of camping gear, guns, fishing equipment, all that kind of things. They outfitted Teddy Roosevelt for some of his uh, uh, expeditions, as well as uh, Ernest Hemingway, and they provided most of the equipment that uh, Charles Lindbergh took across the ocean with him when he made the first transatlantic flight across the Atlantic Ocean. Did that confuse you? Because it did me when I first learned it. It took a long time for it to get in my noggin. Okay, there you go. Uh, that's the Abercrombie and Fitch Company uh, prior to the second world war uh, they did sell some very very quality camping gear and it is highly collectible these days uh, david abercrombie again was much more of an innovator and designer than ezra fitch was and uh in my opinion the abercrombie camp stuff is better camping gear 
than what was sold in Abercrombie and Fitch after he left the company. This design, what we're going to call the cruiser tent, uh, is, pre is uh, present in both companies. Okay. The basic concept behind the design is to lighten the weight of the tent. Okay. By keeping only the part of the tent that you actually need. Okay. Think of a wedge tent. Okay, a wedge tent is like this. Sometimes it's open at both ends. Sometimes it's closed at one end. Sometimes it's closed at both ends. It's like a Civil War dog tent or a World War II, World War I pup tent. Okay, a simple wedge design. Okay. What the cruiser tents do, does, is they take that design make the walls steeper so that they can shed water easier make it out of a much lighter material give it some waterproofing improved ventilation and then cut and throw away the parts of the tent you don't need a wedge tent okay depending on the size if it's a large wedge tent you need to stand up in it if it's a small pup tent, you need to be able to sit up in it. But, you only stand up and you only sit up in one end of the tent. <clears throat> you don't do it in the whole tent while you're doing it. Okay? We're going to go out in the field and show you this tent, this design, and, and you understand what part of the tent we cut off that David Abercrombie cut off when he designed the cruiser tent. Let's go look at an old man in the woods. Well, here we have it. The Abercrombie and Fitch ideal cruiser tent in its natural habitat. Out here in the woods, I've got it set up the way a forest cruiser would have set it up. One line in the middle holds the tent up. Stake it out pull that line it pulls the tent out and then get, start guying it off everywhere difficult to walk around this tent at night so when you go to bed you dang sure better go to sleep right away we'll show you the inside okay now it's usually more preferable not to be an old man when having one of these tents out in the woods but i'm gonna carry on being an old man being in the woods. So let me show you what it looks like inside the tent. Now the first thing is, it's never going to be perfect, okay? When setting up in the woods, you're pretty much limited to the vegetation you've got available to you. So we got a little bit of droop in the corner there. I could mess around with it a little bit more and probably get that pretty tight. But it is a fairly roomy tent. I didn't guy out the, uh, the left side here. Uh, it's a roomy tent for one guy. Two can fit in it fairly well. It's got some good room to be able to sit up in, for sure. And you could probably, oh, I don't know, maybe hunch over and walk in. The uh, floor is a waterproofed cotton drill very very sturdy but the walls well those are balloon cloth treated with either aberlite or tanolite uh, those were the two main waterproofing uh, ingredients for Abercrombie and Fitch the zipper goes all the way up almost all the way up to the fly and there is our Von Langerke and Antoine from Chicago, a division of Abercrombie and & Fitch. And the hookless fastener, what we call a zipper, goes all the way to the top and it still works fairly smooth. And this is the 
storm proof threshold. There's a little pocket there. You stuff your bobbinet mosquito screen down in there and it'll keep out uh, bugs and snakes. Now one of the things that makes this a great tent design is this covered vent here. And you see there we go. There is your bobbinet vent covered by a rain hood. And that will let all of the body moisture that you aspirate during the night to escape the tent should you need to close the front flap. Okay, now here we've got a little bit closer and you can see the design philosophy behind this style of tent. Right there at the top at the peak, right there in front of the, the vent hood, you can see where it slopes down to the rear, see my hand, down to the rear of the tent. And what they did was, is they took a standard wall tent and chopped off the parts that you don't need in order to make this tent lighter than most other tents were of the period. Okay, now we call these cruiser tents, and I believe uh, that David Abercrombie's uh, first uh, naming the tent, the ideal cruiser, is named after a, a, a it's actually a job description in the timber industry, a uh, timber cruiser. A timber cruiser is a guy who goes out in the woods and he catalogs and, and uh, trees, uh, locations of the trees, sizes and types and things like that. And he may be gone from the timber camp for a while doing this job because he's mapping, he's surveying, he's uh, doing botanical work. Uh, so he, he required a portable shelter with him, lightweight portable shelter. And I believe that's why David Abercrombie named this the cruiser tent, the ideal cruiser. Now, again, the same basic design but a larger tent is the Explorer, which is the green tent I'm going to show you here in a second. Uh, it's just got a much larger footprint. It's about two feet wider, about a foot, foot and a half longer, and about two feet tall. Where the ideal cruiser, you can sit up in comfortably and walk in a little hunched. Uh, with the uh, Explorer, you can walk straight in. And you can stand up inside. Now, the two the two examples that we have here, the green Explorer and the brown uh, Ideal Cruiser, uh, are later models. We know they were made after 1928 because Abercrombie and Fitch didn't start putting hookless fasteners, which we call zippers, on their uh, camping items until 1928. Okay. Here's a look at what some of the original, uh, this is an Explorer tent that belongs to a, uh, or may, he may, may have sold it by now, one of our Bannermans camp members, uh, Elliot Cromwell, who is our Abercrombie and Fitch guru over there. If you've got a question uh, on anything Abercrombie and Fitch, he's the guy that can answer it. But this is, this is a tent that he posted in Bushcraft USA a number of years ago. And if you look, you can see that rather than a zipper, it's got this uh, circular uh, or oval-shaped opening, and you gather the bobbinet around the center and tie it in a knot. And then you unloosen it and, and, and scroll it out to get in and out of the tent. Okay, You can see why people were excited about getting a zipper on their tent. Let's take a look at the larger version. Now, we're not going to delve too much into this particular tent, uh, but this is what the Explorer looks like. Okay, let's try it again. Yeah. 
Okay, well, there you go. Now, I, I will mention here that the uh, waterproofing of these tents rendered them uh, unbreathable. That's why it has that large vent in the rear, and that's why the front door is so large. Okay, uh, it retains moisture inside as well as it keeps moisture from coming in from the outside. Okay. This was a major problem for tent design for most of the 20th century. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to listen to this old man talk about this design and how successful it was. The tent first came out in 1908, and in my research I find it attributed to either Horace Kephart or David Abercrombie. Personally, I like to think it was David Abercrombie because it came out a year after he left Abercrombie and Fitch. And to me, it seems like it was kind of a, you know, a poke in the eye to Ezra Fitch saying, you know, if you design the really good stuff that the people want, you don't need to sell all that other crap. The design was so good that it was on the market being sold from 1908 until sometime in the late 1950s, early 1960s. As such, it was probably the most successful tent design, both the Cruiser and the Explorer, which is a slightly larger tent with walls, but that makes these the most successful tent design, commercial anyway, of the 20th century. Okay, well there you go. He's a pretty smart fellow. Uh, there is one other tent design in the history of the 20th century that gives the longevity and marketability of the cruiser tents uh, a good run for its money and may indeed be the longest lived tent design marketed in the United States. We'll get into that when we get into the 1970s in the history of camping gear. Uh, one last reflection I will make is when you look at these tents, it tells you some things about the other gear that these guys were having to carry in the field. Okay. The marketing of this tent assumes a couple of things. Number one, it assumes that the user is knowledgeable in lines, cordage, and knots, basic knots, okay? There's a whole lot of lines holding that dang thing up and pulling it out and keeping it up and all. Got to know a lot of rope work. You would probably have to carry some kind of cutting, a brush cutting device like an axe or a hatchet. Okay, even if it's just to hack away a couple of branches so you can get your lines around the tree. Okay, so there are there is a number, uh, a bunch of inferred gear that goes along with a tent like this, but that is true of all of the shelter systems of the early 20th century. Okay, one, one last thing I, I should mention is there was one additional tent uh, offered by Abercrombie and Fitch and David Abercrombie, Abercrombie's camp, uh, that's based on the same basic, what we're going to call the cruiser design, and that is their, they call it the one-man tent. Strange as it may seem, it was, could only fit one guy in it, but it was basically just a smaller version. Again, the the tents of today, the, the backpacking tents of today that you see, are pretty much based on a design that came from 1908, where it's high on one end and low on another end, and you can sit up in it. A major change between this design and the designs that we use on the trail today comes in the 1970s, and... Uh, We'll be getting to that in a few weeks. Alrighty. I hope you enjoyed this revision 
uh, to the previous video. And uh, every time you make a mistake, try to fix it. We'll see you down the trail. Thank you.